Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I think most of you probably know me from my previous role in, in programs and customer services, but I'm very proud now to be taking responsibility for all of our manufacturing and supply chain and engineering, <coughs> as, as already explained. I think the, uh, it was great fun doing the programs role and the customer service role. Uh, I think the only mistake I made when I changed roles, I, I, I didn't change my mobile phone number. And so I still get phone calls at 4 o'clock in the morning from people on the other side of the world. But I have reprogrammed it now and it says if you've got a customer service issue, press 1. <laughs> and it automatically redirects you to the phone of Didi Everett, Didi Everett which I think is a, is a good solution. <clears throat> but today I'm going to talk to you more about uh, manufacturing, supply chain issues, and, and what do we see as a vision of the future, and, and how to take advantage of the, of the tremendous uh, opportunity that's presented by the backlog that we have today. So, <clears throat> I think if we look at where we are in terms of the, the backlog, you know the story pretty well. And of course that very strong position on A320 and of course A50 just at the beginning of the ramp up. Uh, and I think John probably made some comments earlier this morning that he wants to set the bar even higher. And certainly that's one of the main messages that he gives us today in terms of A20 and even in A50 they'd, they'd like to have more aircraft to sell. So that, that's certainly one of the big challenges for our team. Uh, and it's also a great advantage because when we go out and talk to suppliers, as you can imagine, they're very enthusiastic to be part of this story. And that gives us a lot of ammunition for looking at what can we do different, how can we do this better in the future. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that as we go through today. I think in terms of the, the, the top line, I mean, clearly, you know, we are uh, a global aircraft manufacturer, I think that's pretty well understood. But in terms of just some of the key dimensions, you know, we think about there are uh, uh, 55,000 employees around the world, 42 billion, nine year backlog, uh, over 400 operators, and, and we can add to that 7,500 suppliers around the world. And it's, uh, it's actually difficult to find a place where we don't have suppliers. So a footprint. Although we come from a European base and heritage, our footprint is, is increasingly global. Uh, and we're looking at having the, the right sort of footprint to support and to give the, the real sense to, to our customers uh, of, of what a global company we are. And you can see that if you look at our, our number of production sites, our assembly locations, and of course we've, we've got three uh, assembly locations today, that will soon be four as we bring Mobile online, and that starts later this year. Uh, it's, it's a complex picture with, with all of that in terms of supply chain. It's a complex piece of orchestration to get all of that to work in a seamless way, especially the kind of volumes that we're heading for today. The main issue for us, of course, is commitment, because John and the team have been very successful in terms of winning new business. But we've got to convert that new business into, first of all, satisfying the customer with the, the right quality, the right cost, and the right time. And also, of course, increasingly demanding our shareholders. Because with the change of ownership of the company and the, uh, the stock position of the company today, we, we certainly can see that we're under much more scrutiny. And we've got a bunch of demanding investors that expect a, a, a significant return. So what does that mean for me? Well, it means from a manufacturing point of view, we've got to be looking at how we can drive efficiency. Because the reality is, if you look at how we historically have built airplanes, it was based on we were in a, a low volume, high customized market, uh, and clearly in that situation we were reliant on uh, a network of suppliers that we had worked with generally for a long, long time, usually pretty closely located to our own facilities, and we were using a lot of, if you like, craft skills in how we built the aeroplane. Because that was the way that the aircraft had originally been designed, and it was the way the supply chain and the manufacturing process was, was geared up to work. Now today, if we look at that, and, and we look at the volumes that we're working towards, then that kind of artisanal approach you know, really comes to the limits of what you can achieve. 
There were certainly not at automotive numbers in terms of volumes, but you can see that we're getting to volumes where you know the kind of production rates we're heading towards. You need to build a single aerial aircraft about every six and a half hours. So it is a drumbeat and an intensity that is, is very demanding and of course puts a lot of demand also in the, in the rest of the system and in the supply chain. How do we closely synchronize all of those 7,500 suppliers around the world to that 6,500 tap time, the drumbeat heartbeat of our, our manufacturing operation? And at the same time, of course, we, we want to continue not only to improve the efficiency of our manufacturing system, but the efficiency and productivity of the aircraft. So it's not as if I can say, as, as, a, as a typical manufacturing guy, I'd say, well, like Henry Ford, you know, they can have anything they want as long as it's black. Uh, we've got to recognize that we're in a, a highly customized industry. And at the same time, in terms of product innovation, uh, while we might say that there isn't going to be a huge new product design in the next four or five years, that doesn't mean to say there's any slowdown in terms of the stream of innovation, because we're constantly looking at what are the things we can do to improve the performance of the aircraft, make it more efficient, more reliable, cheaper to maintain. So that means the manufacturing system has to be geared up to, to deal with that kind of uh, constant stream of innovation and change. <clears throat> at the same time, of course, we've got our shareholders. They've got a, an EBIT expectation, and even more important, a cash expectation. So one of the other dimensions as well as pure efficiency, we've got to manage the return on the investment, the, the assets. We've got a huge invested base in terms of buildings, equipment and infrastructure. Uh, and we certainly like not to have to lay down any more concrete, for example. We want to try and optimize the buildings and the assets that we already have in place. Because that will help us in terms of the very demanding cash targets we've got. We've got to find a way to optimize the investment we have, reduce inventories, turn our inventories faster by being more efficient, more lean in our manufacturing processes. And of course, reducing fixed costs goes along with that. And there are many ways that we can challenge that, again, looking at the footprint, the infrastructure in terms of transport, logistics, etc. And above all, we want to be lean, not just lean on the shop floor, uh, because we've made some pretty good progress on the shop floor. And, I'll show you some examples of that. But we've also got to get the same mindset, you know, this, that six and a half hour uh, heartbeat has to go right through the whole organization. All the support departments, engineering, procurement, they all need to feel the same tension that is felt by the guys in the, in the manufacturing process, day in and, and day out. And, and also the great thing I think is in terms of quality, while I think we produce a quality product, we do that often with a high level of inspection, correction, repair, sorting. Uh, so there's a cost of non-quality. And that's a significant challenge for us. And really a big opportunity. How can we reduce the number of concessions, the number of reworks that we do in the system to get the product to the right standard? It's a, it really is a great opportunity to do things significantly better. <coughs> So in terms of boosting our, our production efficiency, I think the way we see that is, of course, we look at productivity improvements, for sure. Uh, but we also look at cost-effective incremental improvement. You'll see a level of automation today. I think we have something like 67 robots in our manufacturing processes today. We will gradually, but not rapidly, be deploying more. But we'll be doing that in an intelligent way because we need to have the automation and the workers work alongside each other. We're not in the automotive business where we could be uh, the automation in every case. We've got to do it in an intelligent way and still with a, as I say, a highly customized product. So we'll come back and show you a little bit of it, more about that in, in, in the next part of the presentation. We've also got to manage those incremental developments. So as well as ramp up that we talk about on single aisle and, and of course 250. We've got to manage a ramp down and then a ramp up on the 330 as we transition from the seal into the neo. So we've got to have the flexibility to respond, to move people around, to deal with the different challenges that come from that. And of course, innovate in terms of those new products that will come online. 
So for me, they, they, we've got to bring all that together. The way we try to do that today is with what we call the Airbus operating system. It's a version of lean manufacturing, which is, is pretty well understood, I think, globally. But we try and bring the same sense of structure, standardization of the work, steady work, uh, visible control, responsiveness, that I think main, the main hallmarks of, of lean manufacturing. And we encapsulate that through AOS, which is our, our process for dealing with that. In terms of what's our vision for the future, what do we think the system will, will, will look like in five years' time, six years' time, uh, kind of, of time scale? Uh, clearly, we want an industrial system that's robust, it's got to be strong to withstand some of the, the challenges, disruptions, because there are still disruptions, you know, the factory fire in a supplier, the, the, the bad weather that stops uh, sea, sea freight for three or four days, all of those things have to be managed inside our system. But the way we're looking at that is to try and have a vision of what do we want the, the production system to look like. How do we test that? So more and more we're doing more simulation in virtual reality of what does the transport system look like? What does the manufacturing system look like? How do we model it before we actually get to design and try to do it on, on, the, on the short floor? We need to do that in a more cross-functional way. And, and we've had, I think, some good success in 350 in terms of getting the design engineers and the manufacturing engineers to work more closely so that we have intelligent design with intelligent automation. And that helps us to eliminate non-conformances, take out product costs of, of quality, and, of course, speed up our, our, uh, our ramp up. We obviously want to keep cutting production lead times. I mean, it's a great opportunity to use this volume to, to be slicker, to manage the process more effectively. <laughs> But at the same time, we want a model that is ergonomic from an employee point of view. We have to recognize that we have a workforce that will progressively get older. And the reality is that some of the things we do when we're building aircraft, they're, they're not the easiest of things to do ergonomically. We've got people working in difficult uh, applications with heavy components, with bad ergonomics. And those are the areas where we try to prioritize the use of automation in an intelligent way to reduce Injuries, musculoskeletal problems, to try and improve quality. And those are our, our kind of priority areas. And of course, I think also we want to try, and you'll see some examples, we want to try and build in the quality checks as part of the manufacturing process, as opposed to a traditional way, which was to build a section or a stage, then inspect it, then fix it, then move it on to the next stage. We're trying to integrate that process using the tools which can do things like clock monitoring, uh, counting the number of bolts that have been fastened in the right sequence. So intelligent use of automation, which is becoming increasingly cheap and easy to access and easier to use, uh, while still being flexible. And of course, at the same time, we're trying to do that all in a, in a, in a term of uh, environmental issues. Because at the same time, within Europe, but I think generally worldwide, we face increasing pressures in terms of the elimination of materials like cadmium. Uh, how do we reduce the VOC output from our plants in the, in the way we paint or clean components? So we've got to bring all of that in mind, that that extra volume that we produce is not deteriorating our environmental footprint and the impact we have on our, our local communities. Like to know, hopefully, this is going to run a little bit. Yeah. 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 Yeah.